colleagues, we have a quorum, and I'm calling the uh, meeting to order. Je vous souhaite le bienvenue au Committee des Affaires Sociales, des Sciences et de la Technologie. I'm Kelvin Nogleby from uh, Nova Scotia, and I'm going to uh, and chair of the committee. I'm going to invite my colleagues to uh, introduce themselves, uh, starting on my right. Judith Friedman from Montreal, Quebec. Carolyn Stewart Olson, New Brunswick. Tobias Berger from Ontario. Art Eggleton, uh, Senator from Toronto and uh, Deputy Chair of the Committee. Thank you uh, very much, uh, colleagues. And I remind us that we are uh, in our uh, order of reference from the Senate of Canada to continue our study on uh, the uh, uh, increasing incidence of obesity in Canada, its causes, consequences, and the way forward. We have two uh, witnesses with us this morning. I will introduce them as I invite them to speak and following their presentations. As usual, I will open the floor up uh, to questions from my colleagues. And by uh, decision at the outset, I am going to start by inviting uh, Dr. James Di Nicolantonio, who is a doctor of pharmacy and cardiovascular research scientist, who is in the preventive cardiology unit of St. Luke's Mid-American Heart Institute. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us uh, today, Doctor and I invite you to uh, make your presentation. Thank you. My name is James DeNicola Antonio. As you said, I'm a cardiovascular research scientist in the uh, Department of Preventive Cardiology, St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm also a doctor of pharmacy. The topic today is going to be refined carbohydrates and added sugars as principal drivers of obesity. So starting with the first slide, I think most of us are familiar with the prevailing dogma in regards to the cause and treatment of obesity. It focuses on calories. Uh, we eat too much. We don't exercise enough. This puts us in a positive caloric state, which leads to obesity, and thus the treatment for obesity is said that we need to restrict calories and we need to work out more. The problem with calorie-focused thinking is that it supports the notion that in order to lose weight, you have to eat less calories than you burn and that all the calories are the same. It doesn't matter what foods you eat, if they're mainly fat, protein, or carbohydrate, it doesn't matter. If you eat 1,000 calories of salmon or 1,000 calories of white rice, as long as you restrict calories, you'll lose weight. But of course, when you restrict calories, your metabolism slows down, thus defeating the purpose of restricting calories in the first place. Additionally, fat promotes satiety, whereas refined carbohydrates and added sugars promote hunger. So calorie-focused thinking doesn't take these metabolic considerations into account. There's now an overwhelming body of evidence that when you restrict carbohydrate without restricting calories, there's prolonged weight loss. And more importantly, most of that weight loss is fat loss. The classic example is from Dr. Alfred Pennington in 1949. He took overweight DuPont executives and put them on a low-carbohydrate diet. These individuals ate over 3,000 calories per day, and while restricting carbohydrate, they were able to lose approximately two pounds per week. Next slide. An alternative view on obesity is that the consumption of refined carbohydrates and added sugars, and when I say added sugars, I'm referring to sh table sugar, as well as high fructose corn syrup, alters our physiology and our hormones, leading to a state of internal starvation. And is this internal starvation that causes us to eat more and exercise less? In essence, eating more and exercising less isn't the cause of obesity. It's a side effect of overconsuming these types of foods. An example of hormones driving uh, you know, such problems with um, our storage of fat would be that these refined carbohydrates and added sugars cause insulin resistance, raising our hormone insulin. And when this occurs, someone with a higher insulin, if you take two people and one person has a higher level of insulin, they're going to store more fat than someone without a high level of insulin, regardless of the calories, that, even if they're consuming the same amount of calories. So a perfect example would be an adolescent going through puberty. They're going to grow at a faster rate because of their altered hormones. Is it so hard to believe that our food can alter our hormones to cause us to become fatter? Another example of how these types of foods cause us to store more fat is that the 
higher insulin levels store fats and protein. So our body cannot liberate this source of energy for ourselves to use, and thus we are in a semi-starved state. Additionally, the insulin resistance does not let glucose into the cell as readily. And thus, again, our cells are literally semi-starved, and that's why we're over-consuming. Another point with higher insulin levels caused by consumption of these foods is that they reduce the burning of fat, and hence we become fatter. Lastly, high level of insulin causes leptin resistance. Now, leptin is the hormone that our fat cells release, telling our brain we have enough energy, we can stop eating, we can start exercising. That pathway is blunted when you overconsume these types of foods. Now, we're going to discuss in the next slide, if you would please flip to the next slide, how we got here. Approximately 200 years ago, we only consumed four pounds of added sugar per year per person. We are now consuming in the United States up to 151 pounds of refined sugar per year. Our bodies just simply are not equipped to handle such a high amount of sugar. Next slide. We have countless amounts of data, including the NHANES data, that clearly indicate that the rise in obesity and diabetes in the United States from 1960 onward was clearly almost 100% driven by an increase in carbohydrate. During this time, saturated fat was not increasing. So we have an approximate intake of 375 grams of carbs in 1960, which jumped above 500 grams after 1995. And during this period of time, obesity doubled from 13% to greater than 26%. Next slide. We have association studies showing that sugar-sweetened beverages increase body mass index as well as obesity. And a prospective trial following 548 children for each additional serving of a sugar-sweetened beverage, BMI significantly increased and the frequency of obesity significantly increased. Next slide. When we look at trials of basically free living people. This is, what ha is what's happening in the real world. They're able to eat and drink whatever they want and as much as they want. If they are supplied with sugar, in this particular study they were supplied with soda, that group increased significantly their body weight. Whereas those that were not provided soda or those provided artificial sweeteners, they lost body weight. All patients received all three interventions either being provided soda for three weeks, provided diet soda for three weeks, or provided no soda for three weeks. If we were to provide, let's say, 500 calories of chicken, would we see an increase in weight? We, so what, what the point of this trial is, is that when you give someone access to sugar and soda, they are going to increase th their body weight. Next slide. In this same trial, when these individuals were provided with soda, they're calorie consumption was almost 400 times that of when they were not provided soda. Their calorie consumption throughout the day was over 500 calories more than those provided diet soda. So bottom line, when we increase our intake of sugar-sweetened beverages, there is an increase in total caloric intake. Thus, sugar-sweetened beverages drive us to consume more calories. Those who argue that sugar is no more harmful than any other type of food when matched for calories, which is also untrue, are missing the point. If a calorie is a calorie, it shouldn't matter what was provided. Overall intake of calories should be the same throughout the day. But when men and women began consuming soda, they started consuming more calories. Next slide. Another trial supporting this. This is another ad libitum study in free living population. They could eat and consume as much as they want. When they were provided sugar, they had a significant increase in body weight and fat mass. They gained three and a half pounds in just ten weeks, three pounds of which was fat whereas those provided artificial sweeteners lost weight. Next slide. How did this happen in this trial? Those provided sugar significantly increased their total caloric intake from baseline. They began to consume over 350 calories more per day. They increased their intake of calories versus the artificial sweetener group by over 600 calories per day. This is what happens in a free living population. In essence, someone who used to consume 2,350 calories once they're provided with sugar, they now eat 2,700 calories per day. And these studies are not outliers. A recent 2012 meta-analysis in the British Medical Journal published by Lisa Tamaranga and colleagues, they gathered 15 randomized controlled trials of these type of ad libitum studies, clearly showing 
that when sugar is increased, body weight is increased. When you reduce sugar, body weight is reduced. Next slide. Now we're going to discuss conflicts to the food industry. This was a systematic review of systematic reviews, meaning they combined all the trials that they found, and when they looked at all the trials with financial conflicts to the food industry, 83.3% found insuffic insufficient support of a positive association between sugar-sweetened beverages, consumption, and weight gain. However, when they looked at the trials without conflicts of interest to the food industry, they found the exact opposite. 83.3% found a positive association with weight gain. In summary, conflicts to the food industry significantly affects the association of sugar-sweetened beverages with weight gain. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr.